Apollo program professor, so I usually talk about getting people to Mars. That's my passion, my human space flight. And, uh, but uh, really, right now, I'm really focused on climate and trying to connect ocean and space, all of our work in ocean and space, because at the end of the day, we're explorers and um, really looking to, to leverage um, from oceans to space. So it uh, seems like a definitely a lifetime ago, we took our sailboat uh, and sailed around the world. It's there, it was educational and a survival, uh, and it really was making contact. So, I mean, uh, you know, please, uh, Katie, what, what preference do you have? Can people um, interrupt questions, or should we keep them to the end? Um, for previous ones, we've kept them to the end, okay. but however you're comfortable. Okay. Well, um, if uh, well, I'm I'm comfortable, you know, interacting as well. Okay, so maybe if somebody has a question, shoot it into the chat, and then we can, Jenny and I can keep an eye on that. Yeah, that would be great. If you know what I'm going to do, I have my mission control. Like all the, um, we did all get a note that your audio is not great, Deva. Oh. I don't know if you have noise in the background or have. Okay, let's uh, let's do that. That's important. Uh, testing, testing, check, audio check. Is it better? I, I can speak louder. Okay. Thumbs up. I see a, I see some heads. What do you think, Katie? Is the audio okay? It's okay. It's a little noisy behind you, so if you can have your mic closer to your mouth, then that would be okay. great. Yeah, it's right here. It's those headphones. Okay. So, um, but I just put the chat. Okay, I just, I see the audio. I just put the chat window up so I can see that as well. Yeah, all right, we, we can all... keep an eye on that for you. Okay, are you all looking at the, the, um, the presentation still? Yes. Okay, excellent. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run, run through this. Um, now I put the chat in a different window just so I can see what. Okay, so I want to take you on a quick uh, exploration around the world. And um, he and I, just two of us, it was uh, um, our exploration. Like I said, we think a lot about uh, space exploration, but also uh, living off the grid and climate and sailing around the world. So it was kind of our, it was on the bucket list. It was our life dream. Uh, the educational um, impact was in three areas, oral histories with, with kids, basically middle school kids, did some younger, some older, and um, a lot of STEM research, and a lot of <laughs> geography, exploration, navigation. Uh, okay, uh, Guy is, is my partner, the captain, uh, space architect, designer, and uh, he taught me how to sail. I taught him how to ski. Um, <laughs> okay, I was the first mate, and uh, kind of have a career flying space flight experiments and teaching at MIT. And uh, we lived through this. That's Galatea. So that's uh, our home. That's our vessel. We're, so we're pretty attuned to living in isolation <laughs> and off the grid. Um, so during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic that we're happening, and it uh, brings back. Okay. So our mission was to promote educational ideas, science, technology, global change, and really betting on the next generation. Sorry, Deva, just quickly. I wonder if somebody said that the mic itself might be the problem. Maybe unplugging the mic and talking to the laptop directly. You are still getting some static behind you. It's tough to hear. Hmm. Okay. Um, I can do that. It's strange. This is headphones usually work well, but um, you guys hear something that I don't hear. Obviously, are you still hearing it? Yeah. Okay, I unplugged and plugged it back in. Tell me how, what do you, what do you hear? Or maybe just keep the mic up closer to your mouth. Yeah, it's right, it's right here. Do you still hear the feedback or no? That's better. You're, you're at least louder than it. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, we could, we can try the laptop uh, mic next if, if it's really bad, but usually that's a little bit, I mean, it's right laptops right here but let me know shoot that's too bad okay. okay no that's better if you just project a little more that's okay much better all right fantastic carry Sorry on about. okay no, carry on no worries. thank you okay so where were we we were we were going around the world and we were teaching kids and as many as possible uh so uh basically boston uh down to the caribbean uh the first leg first 500 nautical miles to bermuda uh everything breaks <laughs> after 18 i didn't mention 18 months on the boat everything at least breaks once if not twice and um you want to have you want to have a lot of spares you have to be really creative and really resourceful uh, we had a wonderful nasa title solar system ambassadors to try to bring uh, space exploration to kids all around the world 
which was uh, an honor and a privilege for us. Okay. We also brought in our, from our guardian angels, we brought in our you know, astronaut friends and colleagues, and we had three-way video, as you all don't know this, but in 2002 to 2003, when we were going around the world, there was no Skype. There was no three-way communication. These were thousands of dollars of uh, getting kids together. We always had a U.S. school with an international school, say, you know, Panama or Australia, 33 island nations we went to. We did about a dozen um, three-way video conferences which uh, took a lot of logistics uh, to set up, but it was really well worth it. And uh, trying to teach and, and interact and telling basically recruiting the next generation of astronauts, you know, uh, seriously saying every island student, kid, um, they're explorers by nature. And they've also dealt with a lot of hardship and isolation. They know someone, one of their family members typically, who's maybe perished at sea. And so, when you were saying, well, you know what this is like, what being an astronaut is like. So yeah, you're from Panama. We haven't had a Panamanian astronaut yet, but you know, you're, you're well suited um, in terms of exploring and learning from nature. And uh, we wanted to learn, of course, just as much as anyone else, and even an enormous amount from indigenous peoples, indigenous peoples and islanders, because they live pretty much completely in balance with nature. So. Um, I was mentioning the first leg. Uh, we actually had two. I had my postdoc and, and a colleague. We had four of us get into Bermuda, and um, <laughs> we had we had 50 knot winds in the Gulf Stream and had to turn around and head back to Boston. Uh, uh, Brian, my my mate, we blew up our spinnaker pole. Uh, we had to take all the sails, and it, it was rough. We had um, we actually had 10 meter seas, 30 foot, 60 feet peak to peak, and that's when you know how seaworthy your boat is or not. Um, so <laughs> we survived, we limped into Bermuda. That's another story. Now fast forward, because uh, you only take pictures when it's really sunny out and it's beautiful, right? So we have all these, we don't have videos and you don't put your nice camera out when you're, you know, about to be <laughs> demasted. So um, you'll see all these lovely, lovely, beautiful, sunny pictures from me. Um, cultures, you know, in the Caribbean, you know, Carnival. Uh, if, you, if you don't know the San Blas Islands, uh, we're getting now to the Panama, but we're in the Caribbean side. People always say, what was you know, your favorite island in the world? Well, I would put the San Blas Island, especially the culture of the Kuna Indians, right at the top of my list. It's an amazing uh, culture, and I have lots of stories that we don't have time to, to tell, but, uh, you know, ask me later. The Panama uh, um, Canal Crossing is something. You, you got crew, volunteers, uh, UK, someone from Alaska, someone from the UK, and a French Canadian um, with, with us because you have to have 150 foot lines, 150 foot lines, uh, you know, four of them to get through and we're behind, you know, that big boat. We wait three weeks, a lot of paperwork, it's a lot of money for us. The big boats are paying for, you know, the real cost. Oh, you also see an Argentine flag on our stern. We are a U.S. Um, registered boat. Uh, he is Argentine and American. We flew the Argentine and American flags, and more often than not, kept Argentine flag up. It's sometimes um, people are not so friendly when you're flying the American flag. So legally, we flew the American flag uh, coming in and out of port, and then we would typically roll it up. So that um, um, anyhow, yeah, a couple instances about that too. Pretty interesting. Again, we spoke Spanish when we could. Just and try to be as friendly as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so the Panama Canal crossing was amazing. We got to go two days, which is great. We're a small boat, so we got to be in the, the lakes overnight. You don't go swimming because there's a lot of alligators in there. And uh, the, they joke, they put the training pilots on board before they get to the big boats. They put the training onto the sailboats. And they say, oh, it's only, only Germans and, and Americans get eaten by our crocodiles because they're the only ones who go swimming uh, in, in the lake. So <laughs> we didn't get off the boat. <laughs> you don't get off your boat. Okay, uh, lots of navigation, lots of, this is a, a modem on our boat, single sideband radio. I am a ham operator. Um, that was interesting in itself to uh, do Morse code. And now you see us heading toward Galapagos. And uh, this is the, the doldrum, so I'll just, but you know, we're cruising along 6.9 knots. That's, uh, you know, 20 knots of wind. That's, that's perfect. That's like ideal conditions for Galatea. The Galapagos were awesome. Uh, this is the first time in my life I'd been there. Now I've been back um, three or four times. We have friends and colleagues, and, uh, but uh, just a wonderful place in the world. These are Kuna Indian um, 
uh, masks are celebrating when we went across the, uh, the equator. You have a little toast to Poseidon and Galatea is the granddaughter of Poseidon, our boat's name. So of course you have to uh, so, uh, cheers when you make it across there. Well, we're, you know, we're cruising along. I spent two to two to four hours a day doing weather, weather watching. Uh, again, single side band radio, then we're doing weather faxes. They come down. We had 9,600 baht, if you can imagine. That was our communications with, with the world. Um, you know, it's almost 20, almost 30 knots of wind, seven knots. And you're looking at some pictures crossing the Pacific. We lost our steering and we lost all of our hydraulics. So I call it, um, uh, I call it our Apollo 13. And so we were literally out there with that. We had a thousand miles to go to the Marquesas and uh, no steering, lost our hydraulics. The quick, uh, I don't know about, yeah, I, I just have a story to tell you here. So um, extra virgin olive oil, same viscosity as hydraulic fluid. Uh, that took a while to figure out, but uh, it was the eureka moment when I figured out the same viscosity and, and I had bought four liters of extra virgin olive oil in Panama to, to cook with, of course. Uh, but we basically filled our kind of hooked up an intravenous IV to our hydraulic system and steering, pumped in four liters of extra virgin olive oil. And uh, it was a long, longer story than this. It's on our website, you know, uh, galateaodyssey.org. But uh, we made it into, we made it into uh, the Mar Marquesas, basically the Pacific crossing is 3,200 nautical miles. So that's the longest stretch without seeing a rock. And uh, after we fixed our hydraulics with our, our olive oil, we limped into the Marquesas uh, and uh, rested, <laughs> and then fixed our then fixed the boat. Um, it was a pretty major, and we were in communication. And the nearest boat to us was you know 300 or so nautical miles, but the single sideband radio. Every morning we're checking in, so we didn't have a May Day. We just uh, we had no steering, and we're in the middle of the Pacific, and you had to get creative and, and you know pretty quickly. And I'm telling you hydraulic fluid leaks, none of that fancy marine putty, underwater putty, super, you know, superhero glue, but doesn't work. doesn't work with a darn, none of that fixed um, our hydraulic leak. So, okay, moving on, uh, you get to Polynesia, you know, just again, amazing cultures, amazing people, and sometimes amazing weather and, 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 and whatnot. Uh, uh, actually, you got dengue fever in Marquesas, Samoa. We met with amazing artisans. We would usually go to port and, um, you know, then port, we would first sleep and then we would try to meet locals. Even usually we were teaching kids and in Samoa we, we, we didn't teach. So then we had a chance to go out and uh, you know, meet some of the, the islanders and artisans. Um, Chief Foot was our, our host and just, just wonderful and seeing how people live. Uh, Fiji's, you know, these are ancient, uh, ancient. Uh, mountains, really interesting um, in terms of Fiji. Um, again, learning about the Fijian history took a took a wonderful uh, inland uh, trip. Just lots to say about there. I went to Vanuatu. Vanuatu is probably one of my one of my top island nations as well. I would love to return to Vanuatu. Um, Twenty seven islands in an island nation that used to be English was ruled by the English and French colonized at the same time. So you can just imagine, 1980, Vanuatu become its own uh, independent nation, and it kind of speak Papamiento. So it was really, really interesting. And um, we had another disaster leaving Vanuatu. We lost our, we lost our, we actually lost our steering, our compass, our flux gate compass. And you know that's it's kind of a bummer because we were heading out from Vanuatu on a major, you know, uh, one week, ten day cruising. So. Uh, back to Vanuatu, and I had to fix all of our navigation system and had a few few spares. And I think we had to get something um, FedExed in, but DHL, DHL delivers anywhere in the world better than the other options that I found out. So amazing cultures, again, learning from people and uh, finally got to Australia. Now in Australia, we're only halfway around the world. And you know, it seems like we had had enough adventures uh, for a lifetime, big crocodiles. <laughs> we sailed the whole northern coast of Australia, uh, the whole Aboriginal coast, and again, culturally, it was amazing. Uh, went through the hole in the wall. Uh, that's a very special place uh, in the world. Uh, nine knot, uh, nine knot um, currents, and so you got to you, you do a lot of navigation. You catch the current going the right way. 
that's I, have, I don't have time to show you a video on there, but you think you're you think you're running into land, not a not a not a comfortable place on a sail, sailboat. Uh, but it was worth it to see these amazing places and, and meet these you know amazing students. And um, fast forward, we actually spent a lot of some time in Australia, um, but we had to keep going. You know, we were on an 18 month circumnavigation, which is actually really very quick for for a cruising boat. Coco's Keeling is an amazing place in the world. Q&A, let me, you can ask me about the, the Russian who sailed there on a nine foot boat, three meters, but he didn't sell the, he didn't set the world record. We were, we were worried we were going to T-bone him out in the, out in the ocean. You don't want to run over the 70 year old Russian man who's the second oldest man in the world and has probably the second smallest boat <laughs> to circumnavigate. He built it in his apartment and hanging off the deck in, in, uh, in Moscow from scraps. Amazing, amazing, amazing uh, interaction. Beautiful culture. It's Australian island, but it's uh, the ethnicity of Malay. The islands we went to were, were uh, Malaysian. Uh, beautiful place in the world. Uh, you can see some dolphins. You're always, you're always trying to, uh, you can actually see a dolphin fish or um, I don't know if they're sleeping. A lot of, oh, um, we, we uh, sailed three hour shifts. So someone was always awake all night long. We tried two hours, three hours, and four hours, three hour shifts ended up being uh, the best to best for us. Okay, fast forward to, to Mauritius, and now we're going through the Indian Ocean, beautiful island, uh, beautiful history, uh, beautiful Indian shrine, just, and, um, but a lot of animosity actually against um, Americans and British folks in Mauritius. Um, that, that was interesting. And so we lost our generator here. If you've ever tried to wind, wind, um, I don't even know what they're called anymore. But we had we had a lot of trouble and, and couldn't get a lot of things fixed. So this is what happened with sailboats. We bartered and gave someone a, a computer for uh, you know, GPS systems because I had three GPS systems. So I borrowed, I kind of gave someone a, a computer to borrow, and they kind of gave us a bit of a uh, um, what is it? Like something something we needed, and we were borrowing it until we got to South Africa, and then we would trade back. <laughs> So again, when supplies are in, in short supply. And then uh, from Mauritius, actually a, a cyclone, a hurricane came through. We knew we had to, to leave. And so we got out of the, uh, the cyclone, they call it there. Uh, but our buddy, just 100 miles behind us, actually got caught and had to go to Reunion Island for, to, to duck in because there was a major cyclone coming through. And we were trying to get to South Africa. It's dicey. If that's a really, if you don't know, getting getting to South Africa and going across the, the Southern Ocean, um, it's the con, it's the conflux. Getting to eastern coast of Africa is getting around Mauritius is, I mean, getting around Madagascar is really tough. Um, so again, huge huge wind, huge waves. We almost got T-boned by the Queen Elizabeth II. That, that is a big big boat, more like little Galatea, you know, sailing. So. Uh, we made it to South Africa and rested and, um, you know, had a, had, did some tourism. The longest we ever stayed on land was in South Africa for, for three weeks. And we taught a lot of uh, students there as well. Made it to the Cape of Good Hope. Um, lots of, uh, here we kind of had a reunion. One really important thing I wanted to mention is, uh, again, celebrating the holidays. But some of these folks are sailors. Most of them are on land. There's people on land giving us radio uh, weather reports every day, just volunteers on the single side and radio, the hammers. We would check in, you know, sailing vessel Galatea, and you know, give them my call sign. Uh, what's the wind? What's the weather condition? And they're tracking. And here's these wonderful people just tracking boats, trying to keep you safe. It was, it was amazing. And that still exists today for, again, cruisers and sailors checking in with people on land about uh, the coming weather you have a weather report but you, know, you need to be safe so just just amazing and so we were thanking them getting together of course yeah, south africa history and it was amazing and then the final um crossing was the atlantic crossing to try to come back home i had to skip this actually he went but uh, i had to get back to teach at mit so i had to miss um you know one of the i had to miss a, a month or so <laughs> um and the atlantic had the, the least uh, amount of fish um the Pacific was probably my favorite crossing and probably the most plentiful when we talk about ocean life. And the Indian Ocean, probably my least favorite, it, the Southern Cross Wave, and we, it beat us up. It, it beat us up. Uh, they were all spectacular and, and magnificent. 
but you notice you notice a big difference. Um, and um, I didn't mention the Pacific. We saw. I haven't mentioned pirate yet. I haven't mentioned um, overfishing. But if you have questions about that, um, again, this is almost 20 years ago. We saw a lot of that. We saw a lot of evidence of that. And uh, so this is um, some of the Atlantic. And in here, sorry, I want to go through this. Ah, and uh, finally hit, finally hit uh, the Americas, and we ended up in the northern part of, of Brazil. Uh, uh, again, wonderful culture, and made it there. And then I, I flew down to, to visit geeks. I said, I haven't sailed around the world to miss carnival in Brazil. So uh, big, uh, again, just uh, I, think I have a little bit about the education here. I'm gonna, I keep going quickly though. I mentioned three aspects of our education. We had oral histories. So it's basically imagine uh, 12 year olds and they would, put, they, would inter they would put their own answers down for their oral history. What's your favorite music? What's your favorite technology? How far have you traveled? And you can, you can access our website and get the questions you can. But then they had to interview their parents and their grandparents, some of three generations, the same questions for when you were 12 years old, what was the most important technology? You know, what was your favorite book? What was your favorite music? And uh, we had a lot of fun with that. Uh, we did a lot of STEM research, as I mentioned, beaming in our astronauts, interacting uh, with uh, the, the students all over the, the world. And uh, you know, and living in isolation, <laughs> self-sufficient, food habitation, you get you get uh, really resourceful. Um, you get you know, it's really interesting, and kind of get into your Zen mode for sure. Uh, you know, you're off the grid, but uh, it's you, and you know, you're trying to survive. We knew and met um, you know, a number of people, a few people who who perished um, you know, while they were out to sea tell you those stories so you every day is, is a good day and you take one day at a time uh, for sure uh, it informs um, you know all of our work that we do in space and oceans uh, we were only two uh, people going around the world because that was our goal but uh, teamwork training how you will react in the moment of crisis is a really important thing to know about yourself um, so we, we learned a lot of lessons there and um, continue um, thinking about those to this day and then uh, I mentioned the geography, kind of an exploration, uh, teamed up with at the time, you know, National Geographic had really great uh, materials, and so we were trying to give not just NASA materials, but National Geographic materials. Turns out that probably folks in the U.S. and Australia were the worst in terms of geography. Uh, the rest of the world was, um, especially 12-year-olds, let's say baseline 12-year-olds. Um, and uh, how do we know that? Because we had kids uh, make maps of the world. So we would go lecture in person, and then we would, the second day, we would try to beam them in that three-way you know, um, uh, Zoom, you know, Skype, book or Skype uh, interaction, video feed with ourselves in person, the international students, uh, high, uh, middle school in the U.S., from East Coast to West Coast to Montana, where you know, I'm originally from. And... Um, each time it was a different school, a different nation, and then we would have the kids draw their map in 10 minutes, draw your map of the world. And so here's, uh, here's uh, Jose Daniel from, uh, from Puerto Rico, you know, and that's everyone, it's like the New Yorker's view of the world. Everyone draws your city and your continent in the middle, and you kind of forget about the rest of the world. It's, it's really fantastic. Uh, so we have maps from all over the world that kids are drawing. Some of them were very political. Some of them talked about um, hunger and violence and war. And some of them were space maps. Of course, we were talking about sea and space, but some of them were three-dimensional. Some of them were flat maps. It's, it's really fascinating, this collection of maps we have from, from kids drawing their vision of the world. Um, so we call it Galatea Odyssey, World Contact, and that's a, a, quick, uh, a quick look at all the island nations we, we visited. Um, not all of them, some of them. Okay. Ah, and I have a funny thing. I think it's funny. Um, they, they probably, a lot of you are sailors. So when we came back, we're off the boat. And so we kind of um, wrote this on our blog, 10 ways to relate, you know, to sail. And if you don't sail, I'll just, um, so what you do, I'll, I'll just read a few of them off. You know, set your alarm for 3 a.m. When it wakes you up, put all your foul weather gear on, go outside into your lawn and, you know, have your partner spray you with the garden hose and screaming, you know, it's time to reef the main. <laughs> you can... <laughs> <laughs> See, Katie loves that. <laughs> um, Everybody else is muted, so <laughs> you can't hear them. Um, I, how about this one? Uh, 
you know, when the wind picks up outside, run, run inside, open all your cupboards and throw all your glasses and plates on, <laughs> throw all your, all your, <laughs> and swear at yourself for not securing everything. <laughs> so, um, all kinds of things. Um, so that was, uh, it, it was, we learned a lot and that's for darn sure. Okay, I think, um, and then I'll give lots of, lots of thanks to a lot of the folks who, uh, who work with. How, uh, I need a, a time, a time check. We have about a half hour left. Okay, total, but we want to take a good 15 minutes for a Q and A. However long you, yeah, you'd like, yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, well, I want to, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, now that's on, now I want to, you know, uh, Fast forward 20 years after our circumnavigation, but it's kind of fun. Thank you for, for having me um, think about it. I haven't thought about it in quite some time. Now back to connecting uh, NASA work and, and ocean work. If, if you don't all know, we have something uh, called Ocean World Missions. And um, this is uh, the best place to go look for life in, but in the solar system. So first and foremost, Earth and all of our oceans because they're completely under underdiscovered. Uh, but uh, like I say, there's not an N of one, just Earth. When we think about climate and whatnot, we have a lot of planets and we have a, a lot of moons and we know about uh, looking for life and biosignatures in the universe. And so here's um, to scale, kind of some of the favorites, Earth in the middle, of course, and then Enceladus, a, a moon of um, Saturn and Europa, a moon of Jupiter, um, two top candidates, and you can go all the way around, Titan, Triton, Ganymede, Callisto, we should, we should investigate all of them um, to get, look for life evidence of life. So I kind of just um, threw that in there. And then wanted to, I wanted to jump to this slide deck. I think a couple of my students are on as well. Bjorn and Brandon, hello. I'm glad you're on. They're the real experts. I'm going to show you about um, some of the work we're doing right now um, called the Earth Intelligence Engine. And then um, just for 10 minutes, and uh, we're using a lot of Big science for weather and climate is funded in the MIT, uh, from the Air Force, from the MIT um, accelerator. So there's Brandon and Bjorn. I don't know if I have a pointer, but down on the bottom, those are the, the two stars of, of the show here. And um, I think everyone on here uh, has probably seen a lot of carbon dioxide data and a lot of temperature data. So uh, I'm going to just say we're all, not show you my beautiful NASA supercomputer simulations because I think you've probably seen it. I will show you this one. Is, are the videos coming through, Katie? Yeah, yep. All right, I want to show you this because you, know, you might like it. And uh, I think it's really important to think about you know, visualizations and how we can curate all this data, I call it. This is uh, 2017, just a, a month. And so there's Jose, there's Maria. These are typical you know, ocean hurricanes coming up to hit uh, North America. But what this is, the smoke. So if you look in the Northwest, um, you can see the forest fires in the summer. There you see the hurricanes and that sea salt. And look at the dust off the Sahara. That was the element of these core systems or kind of our view from satellites looking down. Um, and I want you to see Ophelia. Ophelia was a really interesting and very strange hurricane we had in 2017. It didn't come to North America. It just went right up the coast of Africa and it just blanketed. And there you see the forest fires in the Iberian Peninsula of Portugal and Spain. Um, so now lots to say about that. I just use this as an illustrative, you know, looking, uh, kind of looking through our atmosphere, looking at our oceans and, and um, putting together um, all this data in a very visually compelling way. So we uh, are trying to convert massive sets of Earth data into actionable items and have platform enhancement models and visualizations. and. Um, I can call it across the subsystems, you know, oceans, land, earth, and from near space. Um, so I'm going to go through this really quickly. We just had a presentation, and people can also tune in Wednesday. We can give you the address of Bjorn and, and Brandon, two graduate students, are going to give a bit of this talk. Um, but a lot of work to do in terms of the modeling observations, um, you know, filling in gaps where we don't have radar. Uh, also, how can we visualize things? We would like to use this. Um, this is actually from, from uh, Chennai in India, huge, you know, four to five million people, six million people in this area, just from 2018 to 2019, major, major drought and huge protesting. So you look at the you know, societal consequences and what can we do to give you satellite images of the future to, to, to work, you know, um, on not just the data, but also the societal uh, implications. Um, so, we have, uh, you know, I look at the NASA satellites every day, so getting a platform, uh, enhancement models, and visualization, which um, 
I think I'm going to skip over this. We'll eat work with our Lincoln Lab colleagues and uh, kind of looking at uh, the weather, like call it now casting with some really great folks at Lincoln Lab. So, so now, what do we know? Six hours, two weeks, you know, about 20 years. So we're really looking at across the whole temporal range and spatial range um, for some of the work. Go through this really quickly. We've just been on this project uh, since, since January, basically, and has some really nice data sets. We're using severe data sets right now uh, for this gap filling and now casting that I mentioned. So um, um, when, it, when it comes to um, climate and, and you know, oceans and things like that, um, we need to, uh, right now the models are not high enough resolution. We can't even use these grids. The goal is to really have a lot more detail and, and fill in and to also add some, some physics-based modeling to these things. I'm skipping over this very quickly, you know, doing something else. So I work with Chris Hale, if you don't know Chris's work from Earth Atmosphere Planetary Science, he's a co-investigator on this work. And um, so they have shown some of their publications, the visual, the visual modeling. Um, Brenda's doing a lot of work in GANs and typically you know, you might have climate data in this wonderful, <laughs> this wonderful chart like that. What does that mean? You can't make sense of it. Uh, you might have played around with GAN paint. This is uh, open. Those are not real people on the left. They look like real people. They've been generated. Um, in terms of GAN, GAN paint, some of the colleagues from CSAIL, we put the input and the pictures here on uh, the middle. And you can just uh, have a Monet uh, image if you want, a Van Gogh you know, an image. And so um, using some generated adversarial networks and we want to use that for basically for it this is satellite image of the future look like over the ocean and land kind of looking at the north atlantic specifically from new england um, to portugal and, and europe and um, this is a data set trained on the chesapeake bay data set uh, we have uh, high resolution data there real image synthetic uh, image um, really trying to um, first of all you know, segment it label it um, try to do a lot more labels and typically people might uh, have you know, six different categories or so, we're pushing that to 15 different um, categories. Um, okay, so this is a bit of a flow chart for the input image, the satellite image for segmenting it, um, feeding the climate uh, impact model, updating your segmentation and then coming up with your style, um, your style transfer GAN for the, for the output. And um, you know, why to offer insights um, offer you know, predictions uh, lots of lots of different reasons so we we'll tell you more about that and then just to um, finish up we're going to announce uh, in the summer we'll continue working on this is the earth science work through nasa and seti's frontier development lab um, that is this earth engine that we call it and then you know our our work is into we're using kind of the physics based modeling and, and the gans to further that as, as well as um getting out there and doing doing a lot of um, outreach. So you know, Brandon um, Chinsky has done this work. Um, if you hop on our, our website, this is the final piece of my talk, earthdna.org is our, our nonprofit. Um, and it's just to accelerate positive change, um, you know, make make the earth work for and the oceans and the earth, all of our earth systems work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time. And so we have something called Climate 101. Um, so recruiting other college folks and you know, even high schoolers to be earth ambassadors. And so that's all up and running. The, the, um, the curriculum is there. And that's a little bit look at the platform development or some of the enhancement models, visualization models. I guess I have a little bit of uh, um, some references there. I wanted to then open it, uh, show you that website coming up, Katie. Uh -huh. Okay, great. So, uh, you know, outreach in terms of the our nonprofit Earth DNA, uh, as I said, trying to uh, have the world work for 100% of humanity. It's uh, academia, governments, business, consumers, kind of everyone, you know, oceans, land, near, uh, air, and near space, trying to connect all of our systems. There's a lot to this. Um, the vision is to empower everyone to act. Uh, we know that if you give people, you know, as much data as possible, uh, that's the easy part. Educating, sharing the data, sharing knowledge, but how do you get people to change behavior? I guess we're running the world's biggest experiment under COVID right now about how we, you know, all change our behavior. The earth, the oceans are thanking us for uh, this sheltering in place, but, uh, you know, we have to think about sustainable, uh, sustainable um, solutions. 
And so if you go through our website showing you those things that uh, we do have really concentrating on all four subsystems, but, but the ocean, you know, again, the ocean subsystem uh, kind of first and, first and, and foremost. And um, the final thing I say is Earth Speaks, this notion of uh, Earth Speaks. The idea there is to um, have an Earth bot, but the important thing is, can we have a conversation with Earth every day? Can I wake up? And, you know, hey, hey, Alexa, how's Earth doing? Mm, you know, not so good, data. No, nope, running a fever. And uh, I don't know if you've seen the background behind me, but, uh, you know, how are, how are the oceans doing, data? And so good, you know, uh, the coral is bleaching. That's, you know, 39 degrees and you know, dead coral, 30%. The Great Barrier Reef taken out in 2016. I mean, you know, this is an emergency and all the, the bells should be going off, but at the end of the day, how do we have the conversation? How do we have the conversation with one another? And you know, how do we act and then, and then move forward? So glad to glad to take any questions on uh, that little potpourri of uh, <laughs> sailing around the world to <laughs> some of our AI work to some of our nonprofit work. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Deva. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing so we can see folks.